My eldest daughter has given me a Shutterfly book, you're familiar, I hope, uh, with those filled with pictures from the previous year. And of course, it includes travel photos, but she also fills it with pictures of daily life, of, of eventful and uneventful scenes. It's a yearbook to remind me of the blessings and the challenges and the changes our family has experienced. And very often, when I pull out that book, I instantly remember not only the people and places, but the emotions surrounding that event. Sometimes I want to transport myself back in time and relive it. Like, I want to see those people again. I want to hear that laughter again. I want to eat that food again. Anybody? We take so many pictures of our food. I want to eat that again. But sometimes I also recognize those scenes in which I might have been smiling on the outside, but inside. I was, as they say in the mental health field, a hot mess. I was a hot mess on the inside. And yet, when I look back through those pages in a broader lens, not just days, but weeks, months, and a year, I see two different threads. Number one is my absolute dependence on God. That's really clear to me. And the second is his complete faithfulness to me. You see, pictures are powerful. And so are songs. And today we're going to uh, look behind the scenes of a psalmist who has had similar experiences just like us. I like what one scholar wrote. He said, most scriptures speak to us, but the psalms speak for us. Oh, do they ever? Mm -hmm. They argue and complain. Yes. They judge and intercede. They accuse and confess. They lament and they praise. Mm -hmm. They tell our story. And, and these words were given to us to help us express our deepest pain and our highest joy. So these are words, they're not meant to be read. They're meant to be entered and experienced. So I invite you already, if you haven't turned to Psalm 84, go ahead and find your way there. We're going to see four distinct scenes that illustrate the psalmist experiences and ours. And for, for the believer, th this is everyday life. The concept of which, for some of us, carries or could carry an immediate connotation of drudgery, of duty, of routine. Nothing special. It's just everyday life. So when you see the title of today's message, that may be how you see it and how you read it. Right? Everyday life. But John 10.10, 10, as many of you know, says that Christ came not only that we have life, but that we have it in abundance. So I want you to repeat the title after me, but I want you to put the emphasis on that second word, everyday life. Somebody, say it with me. Life. life. That, that is what you and I have been offered, and that's what we want to discover today in God's Word. So as we read the psalm, I want you to visualize these scenes, indeed, Photoshop yourself into them, okay, and discover what is the activity of everyday life with God, starting in verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you, Selah. So scene one takes place in the temple where the psalmist experiences the nearness of God. But when he says, how lovely 
is your dwelling place. The word translated lovely is slightly misleading because more than simply describing God's presence as beautiful or lovely, it actually means, listen, well-loved. Well-loved. It's not just the description of a place, but of the psalmist's response to being in God's presence. He loves to be where God is. Listen, because the sanctuary is a beloved place. It's a beloved place. Now, while I'm, I'm exceedingly grateful that we have a place to meet together, the New Testament, of course, tells us that our bodies are now the temple where the Holy Spirit lives. And because of Christ, we have access to the Spirit of God from whom we receive love and acceptance, forgiveness, and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are beloved greatly. I want you to see that the rhythm of everyday life with God includes renewed devotion. Being with God reminds me, it reminds you, you are well loved. You are well loved here, here. The psalmist, of course, has experienced this nearness, but as you notice, beginning with verse 2, he longs to be there again. He is jealous of the birds who live and raise their families right near the altar. And there are seasons, I believe, when we experience the ongoing presence and love of God, and there are seasons when we don't. I just wonder if that's freeing to anybody here. Has anybody ever looked around church and thought, you're the only one not experiencing the presence of God like others? Like, there must be something wrong with you because try as hard as you, as you like, you can't see him or feel him or hear him like others do. And if that's you, I just want you to know you're in good company with the psalmist and the current speaker. I have experienced prolonged seasons when it seemed I could not hear nor sense the voice of God. If that's you, I know this is it's a little uh, daunting perhaps. If that's you, can I see your hand? Because I want to talk to you in particular. Many years ago, I did a study on the eagle in scripture, where, you know, where it mentions in Isaiah 40 that we're to mount up with wings like eagles in order to get a higher perspective, right? And in my study, I found out that eagles, like most, if not all birds, I don't know, they have a homing instinct that helps guide them to return to places they've been before, okay? Now, Hang with me. I don't know how, but researchers, as I studied, have discovered that when an eagle is flying in the wrong direction, she experiences a low-level pain in her eye that signals a need to change course. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. In Psalm 32, it says, the Lord says, I will teach you and instruct you. I will guide you with my eye. Love that. And, and we know that even in our own physical bodies, we experience pain in a similar way. What does pain do? It signals the need. There's something we need to pay attention to, right? There's something that needs our attention. I believe that our longing for God, your longing to hear Him, to see Him, it's a safety mechanism. Otherwise, we would be not just all over the map. We'd be in this ditch, and then we'd be in that ditch. And then we'd come over here to this one again, and the other one again. No, 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 no. God develops longing in us to keep us continually seeking him. And, you know, it also builds perseverance, because we have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to put it one more way. This life is a journey. We need longing for the long haul. We need that 
longing. So don't despair. If you feel that need for God, um, it's because he's calling you. The Bible says we, don't, we didn't love God. We love because he first loved us. He is calling you deeper. He's calling me. Well, this section ends with a Ceylon moment, which is a literary hint from the writer to pause and give deep thought to what has just been said. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And this helps us to know the one consistent activity that we need to put into practice, whether we are enjoying God's presence or longing for it. You know it, and I want to hear you say it. Praise God. Praise God. The modern King James says, they will still be praising you. And I like that. They will still. And I looked that up in the, in the Hebrew dictionary. And I want to give you a few extra words when it says they will still be praising. Those words include they will again praise you. They will repeatedly praise you. They will yet praise you. And then it says all life long. They will continually praise you. And there is power in that statement. Yet I will praise you. I will praise you. You and I are counted as blessed when we release our praise from being contingent on our circumstances and praise God consistently in spite of them. We got to get to that place. Everyday life with God requires everyday praise. Everyday praise. So, so far, we've been encouraged to seek the presence of God, to develop our longing for God and to continually praise him in the process. And the second scene portrayed in Psalm 84 is also, this is one that we can all relate to. Picking up in verse 5, it says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Okay, so strength, of course, is a necessity in any journey. But notice that more than having strength, he doesn't say, blessed are the strong. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose strength is in God. This is about where we find our source of strength. Right? So that's a, a familiar concept to us, having strength in God. But did you know there's another word for strength when it says that, and it means security. Mm-hmm. Blessed are those whose security is in God. Now, here's the truth of what we do, whether we know it or not. We put our strength, that is, we put our security in other people, Amen. in institutions, We put it in our hopes for our future, right? And then when those things invariably fail, which they will, we're devastated. Our trust is broken because those things were never strong enough to hold it. Whenever I become over-concerned or worried, it's a telltale sign. There is something or someone other than God, in which I have placed undue trust and dependence. And the options, of course, right, are seemingly endless. It could be our spouse. Uh, did you know it could be your children? Ouch. Undue trust, dependence. Our community leaders, um, our pastor, can have undue trust and dependence on him. It could be our economy at large or our not-so-large bank account. Okay, Whenever you and I give control to someone or something that we cannot control, the result is anxiety. Unless it is the sovereign God. So at the beginning of every day, first and often, 
let's remind ourselves that God is the source of our strength today. And, and I just, you got you to gotta put that in there. Because, again, we've seen and we know it. God is the source of my strength. No, you need to say and I need to say. God is the source of my strength, of my security today. Amen. Today. Mm -hmm. So the second part of verse 5, this is highly descriptive. And I want you to see the literal translation. I hope I made a slide for that. If not, I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, because it says, happy are those whose strength is in you. The highways are in their heart. The highways are in their heart. So if ch as children of God, we all understand that this life is a journey. It's a highway, listen, to be traveled with God and for God. Amen. Life as pilgrimage means that we give thought to connecting the scenes along the way. And in doing so, we can see this life as one long canvas painting in which we are inhabiting a moment in time. You and I, we are a screenshot today. But it's within a wider context of God's faithfulness and love for us who is in this moment and the next working out all things for our good and his glory. That's our context. Here's our screenshot. That's our wider context. Context, God is taking me and he's taking you on a journey. He has a plan. Uh, and here's the thing. It's going to include some challenging terrain. Might as well just, uh, just accept it. You've already been there. Listen, the way is hard. And many people along the way are hard. <laughs> However, we have a map, we have a guide with which we navigate our current path. So that means we have to talk about valleys today. Got to talk about valleys. I'm going to say this point just up front first, that the pursuit of spiritual intimacy passes through the context of adversity every time. So I'm going to say it again, that the pursuit of spiritual intimacy, that is that connection with God, that um, presence day living with God passes through the context of adversity. Most commentaries agree that there is not a physical valley named Baca, but since the word means weeping, we're meant to understand this as a metaphorical valley of tears. My journey and yours are going to be marked by seasons of grief and hardship and loss. Valleys are inevitable. We will pass through them. Amen. Amen. It says we'll pass through them. But I want you to notice the psalmist didn't just get through it as fast as he could. Now, this, was a, this was a great insight for me. Because we want to focus, and I was just going to have you repeat after me, as they pass through, everybody say, pass through. And I'm like, like, we're just going to run through the thing. No, it's, it's not what the word says. He didn't get through it as fast as he could. He made it a place of springs. And I want you to see that connection between the water of his tears, the water of the springs, and the water of the autumn rains. I think the, the meaning is clear that he stays there long enough to allow God's strengthening presence in a dry and barren place to literally change the landscape. As we pass through adversity, we are changed, and then we make a positive impact on the difficult environment in which we live. That is the power of God. That is the power of God. And I want to segue just briefly to one, uh, Psalm 126 because it, it ties in so beautifully uh, with this. I want to read just that very last 
uh, verse that's in that song where it says that those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes forth weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying his sheaves with him. So you and I are not meant to just go through seasons of grief. We're meant to grow through them. And with the power of God, seasons of grief have potential to bring new life. He's going to sow that seed, and then he's going to return with sheaves. That's the promise, right? That's the picture. And and although carrying seed, uh, the picture there that it says, it, it suggests ongoing work, yes. But when we understand that analogy um, as the seed in the New Testament, as the word of God, I think the meaning becomes clear that the activity in the valley of tears involves carrying, planting, and watering the word of God, both in our lives and in the lives of others. So everyday life involves cultivation. Everybody say cultivation. Cultivation. Mm. And how do we do that? I think we do it the same way the psalmist did, by speaking God's word over our lives. And you can put it to song if you like. Like, you can make that your song. We say to him, God, you are faithful. And then we water it with um, our prayer, through repetition, through meditation. Listen, an application. We do not just say it. We believe that our God can do what he says he can do. So we say you're faithful. We say you are sovereign alone. And I tell him that all the time. Listen, we got us a crazy and carnal world down here. But you have not abandoned us. And Ephesians 1.11 says that you are working out everything in accordance with the purposes of your will. I got to know that. I got to know that. He is in control over this world and over me. And over me. When I had an inconsolable infant, um, can I just, we both cried. Anybody, anybody just hold your child? They will not stop. You just, I just, we cry together. We cry together. However, I sang this one song over and over again. I hope you know it. It was, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Like, I, I needed a song that, like, spoke to my circumstance. I can face tomorrow because he lives. He lives. It's also how we sow the seed. I have stood over cribs, um, and there's somebody in this season right now. I have stood behind teenagers' closed doors, and I have prayed the promises of God in their life. Not only was he faithful to them, he encouraged me. Like, I did it for both of us. I did it for both. And I have you know, like when I was studying this all over, and it was, it was such an insight and such a beautiful um, fulfillment when I said to him, I am carrying sheaves. <sighs> I got me some sheaves today because I planted the seeds of promises decades ago. I, I, I am carrying sheaves with me and I'm also continuing to plant not just a few not just a few and of course sheaves take time right it's it's going to take time for them to grow both physical and in the spiritual world bible tells us that and we know it it's seed time and harvest Right? And an essential part of that second season of waiting is worship. Both in Psalm 126 and in our current Psalm 84, worship is accompanied by tears. Well, praise God it is because I have them. There, is, there are many reasons why I don't sing on worship. Uh, I cry when I sing. And I'm just, it's not pretty, but it's authentic. I water it. A water, it's cleansing for me. Worship is accompanied and expressed 
by weeping. So let me say this. Don't you wait to worship until after you pass through that valley. What does the text say? As they pass. Right there in the middle of it, you worship. Because the valley is where we bring a sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice going on. And in order to understand Psalm 84, 7, which is they go from strength to strength, I want you to look back to see who they are. Who who are they? And in verse 4, they are the people who continually praise God. In verse 5, they find strength. That is, they find their security in God alone. And as we just discovered in verse 6, they change the landscape of adversity through worship and weeping and waiting. And then here in verse 7, they are strengthened by God to complete the journey. Now, I wanted you to see those connections as essential because we cannot just latch on to verse 7 and declare that God makes us strong. I don't think strength in God is a name it and claim it promise. Just kind of, I know, it's kind of like, gets a little quiet. They're like, wait a second. Are you saying God does not? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Rather, it's when we continually, we got to be all the they's. When we continually seek the presence of God in praise, when we trust him when the path is hard, when we worship through our tears, and continue to serve him as we wait that we become strong. God takes us from one level of strength to the next. I think we see that spiritual strength is not bestowed. It is acquired through participation with and obedience to God. Strength is acquired. I just want to ask you, what is one thing that you know that God's been asking you to do, but you've been putting off? Here's what I know. God is good, and his ways are good. He's not trying to boss you. He's trying to give you life. He's trying to give you life. He's trying to give me life because everyday life with God includes growing in obedience to him. It has to. Well, the next portion may appear to be a sudden change in thought, but again, when we view this as an adjacent scene, it's a very understandable next step. Looking at verse 8, Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty, listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor, On your anointed one. Now, at the time that this song was written, of course, the king was essential to temple worship. He had a role in protecting the people and access for worship in the temple. I think a broader understanding for us today would include prayer, yes, for our leadership, both within and outside the church, who have been anointed by God to do his will locally, nationally, globally. I think it fits with Jesus' prayer when he said, and he asked the Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I see this concept or the the placement of prayer in this song as essential because he ties it directly with the psalmist's distress in the last few verses, and his powerful conclusion in the next, right? He knows what we know, that prayer is an essential link. I put it this way, don't don't let's get caught up in our own situation that we neglect to pray for others. We just have to. Everyday life with God includes prayer that his purposes will prevail. His, let your kingdom come. And then after he considers the needs of others, the psalmist's thoughts return to his own situation. And instead of wanting more, he's grateful for what he has. Verse 10, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked 
And I think his declaration is meant to challenge our priorities. For him, God's presence is one in a thousand. There is no place he would rather be. What statement of contentment can you and I make to God? Instead of looking around constantly at everything that you wish you had, is it possessions or position? Is it acceptance or appreciation? Is it time or talent? Can you just stop and long enough to notice the blessings that you already have and voice gratitude for those? In his book, Gratefulness, the Heart of Prayer, David Stendhal Rass wrote this, the root of joy is gratefulness. Listen, it is not joy that makes us grateful. It is gratitude that makes us joyful. So if you and I misplace our joy, we're going to find it again by cultivating gratitude for the nearness of God. We're going to read the last two verses, and the band can come back up. Um, Starting in verse 11, it says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Okay, this last part is so, so good. I don't want you to miss it. Mm. So stay with me and just tune back in if for some reason you've been distracted outward, which I I totally get that. But throughout this psalm, the psalmist has painted a picture of the consistency of God in his life. In every season and for every need, God has been present and active. And what I discovered is that he uses no less than 11 different names or combination of names for God, okay? At the beginning, he calls him Lord God, Yahweh, the self-existent, eternal God. He calls him Lord Almighty, the God of hosts or God of army. Your God is a God of armies, the sovereign commander. He is the living God in contrast to the lifeless idols that no doubt were worshiped in his day and ours. Ours is a living God, he calls him king, who is ruler, Elohim, who is creator. He speaks of God in Zion, who's God over his people, God of Jacob, who made and fulfilled covenant promises. And then here, he calls him a sun and a shield. He's giving life and protection along your journey. Our God pours out favor and honor and goodness because that's who he is. It's who he is. The psalmist calls him by multiple names and attributes to remind himself and us that if we need life, we have a life giver. If if we need protection, we have a protector. And if we need a way, we have a way maker. We are meant to experience God as everything we need at the moment that we need it. So since we can't really see this concept as clearly in our translation as it is in the Hebrew, I want to close with an example in English by reading the lyrics of a song by Donnie McClurkin. I really hope you know this, and if you don't, you got to look it up, because it totally captures this idea. And he starts out and he says, I call you holy. Your name is holy. You have been so holy to me. I call you holy. Your name is holy. Holy you are and holy you'll be. He says, I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. You've been so righteous to me. Oh, God, help me. I'll call you righteous. Your name is righteous. Righteous you are and righteous you'll be. And he follows that same pattern through all the different verses. And he says, I call you awesome. Your name is awesome. I call you faithful. You've been so faithful to me. I call you healer. I call you savior. And in the climax of the song, he closes with this. I call you all that. Your name is all that. 
Because you've been all that to me. I call you all that. Your name is all that. All that you are. And all that you will be. You will be. It's who he is. It's who he is. Everyday life with God includes celebrating the ongoing presence and activity of God. However you've experienced the presence of God in your life, I think it's safe to, safe to say he is more. He is more. And he wants us to know and love him more. So wherever you find yourself today, in seasons of contentment or need, in satisfaction or confusion, whether in tears or rejoicing, enter anew into everyday life with God. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are everything that we need. All things are possible with you. You are life giver. You are healer. You set us free from every stronghold. Your word says that we have the mind of Christ. You tell us what we need to know when we need to know it. You are our help. So we come to you today. And oh God, if there's anyone who wants to come for the first time today, you are so welcome here. Father, you call and we respond however we need to respond. This is a well-loved place. And we praise you. We love you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.